Hello and welcome to Love and Skulls Tarot. This week's flip through is The Witch's Tarot by Ellen Cannon Reed. Get that back in a little bit of order there. And you can see it's got the same plain back. This particular deck is an original. There's no box. I can't prove it unless there's something different in the cards themselves and I haven't researched that much. But I can tell you that Wikipedia says this deck was published in first time in 2002 and that is not correct because I got this deck before I graduated college. I'm sorry, my friend bought this deck. I bought the book because I couldn't afford the deck at the time. So 2003 is incorrect. The correct date when I found it, I had to work, work a little bit, is 1989. This deck was probably bought in 1990 at a small pagan gathering of about 150 people in Sholo, Arizona from Ellen Cannon Reed. And Ellen Cannon Reed is one of the reasons that I don't really support Llewellyn very much. I have in the past, but I no longer practice Wicca like I used to. Because to meet an author of a tarot deck, like something you're like, oh wow, that's so cool. Meeting authors. When you meet authors who are having to sell the decks, books, whatever that they've published to make their rent. When it comes to a publishing house, you're like, well, how is that? How are they not making any kind of a living whatsoever? So the Lennon does not have the greatest reputation. I'm not sure if it's gotten better since then. This was in the early 90s, so I can't speak to it now. So on with the tarot, ow. You know what? That was such a good idea when I put that there at first, but I just burned myself. All right, card one is zero. <laughs> the Fool. The Fool, again, there's nothing particularly different about this Fool. There's no dog. And the Fool looks like he's got a letter or a photo as they are about to walk right off a cliff. It looks like they're in motion. And we've got a living branch, which says Vitality. It's, it's just a really nice Fool card. It's a good representation. The Magician in this case has the four tools, the symbol of eternity, and robes. And I think this one is meant to look a little bit more pagan druid because this person was a pagan druid. And an interesting thing about Ellen Cannon Reed is that she studied the Kabbalah and wrote about the Kabbalah and tarot together. I know that's not necessarily that interesting because the two pillars were in the Rider Waite. So there's Rider Waite, but there's also some modern at the time, late 80s kind of neo-pagan, Wiccan, etc., symbology in there as well. Again, high priestess, and she that is what a Wiccan high priestess looks like to me. But today, you might think she looks a little bit like she could be in that movie Midsummer. She's got the silver buckle garter, representative of the witches who were burned. The Empress, very fertile looking. You can't tell if this figure is pregnant or not. But we've got grapes in the trees, we've got flowers, we've got it's definitely not cold. It's very abundant, as the Empress generally is. And I like that the hair is kind of blonde, but kind of getting silvery. The Emperor is, looks like a king, looks like really any emperor to me. But this could be reminiscent of an Ankh right there. And you can see that there's some wands on the ground. The High Priest is the High Priest in more of a neo-pagan Wiccan kind of way, and that's the Ritual of the Chalice and the Blade. The Lovers, I like it because, I'll be honest, I get sick and tired of seeing nude, long-haired, perfectly built, almost comic book body women, femme women, on cards. So, uh, I mean, yes, these are perfect ideals, but at least we get some dick, right? And it's the lovers being blessed, but look how the the femme figure is looking up while the mask, masculine figure is looking at the feminine figure. It's interesting to me, I mean, this isn't to me gender specific, the lovers really aren't. Of course, it's got the Gemini, sometimes flakiness there, but it's very interesting that one figure is looking more towards the spiritual, one is looking more towards the earthly. It's a balance and duality, as ever. The chariot, we have two sphinxes that look a little pissed off. I mean, a black and white, that's just balance. Those are, it could be purple and yellow, it could be red and green, it could be blue and orange. It's, you know, just think of it that kind of balance. We have a massive, what looks like a massive eclipse back there. 
and someone who looks pretty Roman. This, this looks pretty Roman, but of course with the Egyptian sphinxes. So whoever fought with chariots back then, we know the chariot comes roaring in. And here we have a really good depiction of strength. And we often see in strength a nude or topless woman, you know, whatever it is, what it is. But the idea of a nude character or figure on this card is a complete lack of fear a complete lack of fear and through gentleness and love brings that strength around to tame the lion who is then giving kitty kisses. The seeker, we've got the lantern in the dark. To me, there's also a little bit reminiscent of Hecate, but the wind at the back looking beyond. Again, we almost look like we have a sun or a moon set and the clouds may be stormy and the wind may be blowing. But this figure is looking up into a more spiritual place. It's a very spiritual card. I mean, and the word spiritual is so generic, but that's so you can fill in the blank with your own idea of what spirit really is. Justice is the 10. This is different in this deck because justice is generally the wheel of fortune. So justice being the 10, I'm not really sure why justice is a 10. It's balanced. Maybe it's to go with the other cards in the deck. I'm sure it has something to do with Kabbalah, as do the colors. I mean, we've got the red, yellow, green, blue kind of a color scheme, primary colors. But I didn't go back and completely reread her book to understand exactly what those colors are. So that's my fault. But we replace the 11 with the Wheel of Fortune. And the Wheel of Fortune shows, I mean, in no uncertain terms, the life cycle, which traditional Wheels of Fortune do have that as well. This is for the eight, the eight spokes are for the eight holidays of the year and the cycles of life. I think that's pretty obvious. The Hanged Man is somebody who is very strong. And you'll notice we've got one eye patch, so you have to see from a different perspective. This figure is upside down and has a patched eye. So this is, look at it from a different perspective. Death has a pretty standard meaning. You can see we've got the skeleton cloaked with the cutting side to cut the threads. And you can see we've got a priestess, we've got a king, we've got what looks like just the rabble. Everybody dies in the end. Death is equality and death is change. Temperance, patience, you can see we've got the eagle and the lion, two of the writers of the gospel. I forget who is who, but these this represents the four elements, uh, fire, water, air, earth. And there's the cauldron of the ether with Mars. Interesting. The devil, we have two naked figures running away from someone kind of almost unnaturally built up well, he's like, hey, what's going on? Pretty standard for the devil. It's kind of an earthly feeling. And again, just like in the lovers, you can see that the, the figure defined as in this binary representation, the femme is looking up while the masculine is looking forward. I don't buy feminine masculine. One figure's looking up, one's looking forward. The tower, that's pretty much lightning's coming out of it. It's exploding. We, we know the tower can be painful change, sudden, painful, unexpected change. The star, the star is frequently naked, kind of the anima mundi of the alchemical. Interestingly, her foot's not exactly in the water. She's got water pouring from both, and this one's going right back into that one. If you see, it's actually kind of the same pool. So I don't know if this is made by that jug, but it's really interesting to me to see that and to be this green and fertile and back there you can see it's a much more dry area. And the figure is older. I really, really like that the figure from here, the figure looks older, although the body does not. But I guess modern science, we're getting there. The moon has got pretty much similar imagery and no towers. You still got your fish, You've got a couple critters here. You've got two canine lupine figures braying at the different phases of the moon. That's a little bit different, different phases of the moon. A little crab, pretty standard. The sun, two younger people, but again, I'm gonna point out the balance of the traditionally femme figure 
standing in water and the traditionally masculine, even though they hit it, is not standing in water. And this is intuition and physical. And again, we've got a balance. A lot of tarot cards talk about balance. And you don't necessarily see that so much in the descriptions, but it's so obvious when you're looking at them, how much is in there to balance. So when you see some pretty good analysis of tarot, there's a lot about balance. And I think that Arthur Waite and Rebecca Smith really tried to get balance in their figural representations of the pips as well. Judgment, we're all judged in the end. Again, another reminder that everybody dies in the end. So we've got Gabriel, and the sun and it's not a bad card it just means that ultimately we are all equal and the universe again the nude anima mundi with the scarf wrapping around you can see the power coming out of the hands and we've got the four writers of the gospel on to the wands for a second there, I thought that was a sword. I love that this has the feeling of Mercury, that kind of movement of the wands, and that it's a nude figure, which is, we could say masculine, you could say androgynous, androgyne, you know, whatever, androgynous, however you wanna say it. But we've got space, the stars, the moon, there's a lot going on in here, and this is a card of action, Ace of Wands, new passionate start. Whatever the passion is, it doesn't have to be sex, guys. Okay, two of wands. You can see that it kind of almost looks like he's manipulating these what appear to be leaves in the sand. And if you think about it, the Silk Road coming from the desert being a place of plenty with uh, merchants makes a lot of sense with that card too. The three of wands, I think this is the three fates personally. But again, we have a maiden, mother, and crone figure, very, very common and very popular in neo-pagan and Wiccan and non-Judeo-Christian Muslim faiths. Very popular, it's the three phases of life. I mean, okay, I love this Four of Wands. What I love about this so much is that first of all, these people are standing together and the divine inspiration. It's absolutely beautiful. I adore the idea behind this card. And that is another thing that tells you that sometimes with the cards, always look at the pictures. Even if you know what the meanings are, always look at the pictures because the pictures are gonna tell you more. They're gonna tell you the artist's interpretation of the cards and they're also gonna give you a clue as to what's happening in the reading you're doing. Five of Wands, we're fighting. We're not fighting though. We are standing on a, a dais, a natural rock dais. This looks kind of druidic to me. And everybody is there with their wand. Maybe not exactly playing homage, but I don't feel like they're trying to get on that rock. I don't feel like they're trying to knock them down. It's not people fighting amongst themselves as much as people almost paying fealty. Six of Wands, really interesting. With the Six of Wands, it's victory. There's a dude riding on the horse in the rider weight. And here, it's a figure with just two sets of threes, three and three, protective, protective, wands laid out in this clearing. But this clearing is abundant. It is lush. That is a lush forest. And this person isn't like emaciated or anything. They're clothed in decent clothing. I, I just think it's another card of abundance. I mean, it is a card of abundance, but I think that they depicted it beautifully. The Seven of Wands is really interesting. That's like an inner turmoil card in other decks. But in this one, the Seven of Wands is an artist card. And I wouldn't have thought of that so much. That's kind of trying to get what's in you onto the creative. This is creative use of your inner turmoil to me personally, but I mean, we're not in a reading, so of course all the cards are dependent on each other. Eight of Wands, I love that it's a book because Eight of Wands is frequently messages, right? So we're reading a book, it's knowledge, it's messages, and it's usually coming pretty quickly. And you can see that this figure is smiling a little bit, probably because they're just got their beard trim that's nice and shapely. The nine, not looking so good. This person actually even looks a little bit anxious but it's mirroring. I love that it's mirroring. It's a reflection causing anxiety. This is a, actually a really great deck. I, I may have to pull this out and play with it again. Can't say that I will, but I might. Uh, with the Ten of Wands, we have 
so much gathered together, a lot going on, but you're just this side of getting through it. There's just one more pass to make to get to that home. And the home is representative of, you know, peace and happiness and a place to relax, sanctum, sanctorum, you know, your sanctuary. Princess, this uses princess, prince, queen, and king. And I put it in that order, even though I kind of want to put the queen at the top. And I can't remember who does that. I can't remember if that's was Wait who put that at the top or if it was Crowley. Anyway, it's a good idea because the queen being the ultimate idea of each suit makes perfect sense. So these don't really say anything. This is the princess in this case, which would be a page, which could also be a squire. Again, if you're going to have a youthful, could be youthful, could be if it's a person representative, could be youthful and could be an androgynous person. The prince, again, action. You see, we're moving. We've got a living rod. There's still leaves on it. We are moving. We still have that abundance. You have a nice road ahead of you and you're just going forward. The queen is more tranquil. You can see there's a breeze, but not too tough of a breeze. And the figure is standing in a very orderly place. It's, I mean, it's, you know, a figure card. The king is in winter, which I think is interesting. These are seasons. Oh my God, these are seasons. I'm an idiot. I'm an idiot. That is autumn. That is summer. Queens are spring. Kings are winter. Holy shit, y'all. This deck, this is a great deck. All right, so we've got the Ace of Cups. This one is really, sorry, I was about to hold it up, but I'll put it here where we can all see it. This, I love, love, love this eagle because it almost makes me feel like a phoenix rising. We've got the crown. Crowns in the cups are indicative of the grail. But again, we kind of have the anima mundi, the figures holding, I think, the world or the moon. It's intuition beautiful coming out of the clouds instead of and holding this so instead of just a hand coming out of the clouds we have this figure coming out of the clouds like a goddess the two of cups is really interesting to me because this figure is climbing up this one has both of the cups and is up there but this one's kind of down here in the cold that's interesting because that would not be my interpretation of the two of cups but again this is why we like to have different decks they're very very interesting I don't know that I have really much of a comment there except that this person better catch up, but it does look like this person has already climbed and this person is climbing after them. Generally, I see Two of Cups as the ultimate partnership card to me. Three of Cups, this is a fantastic Three of Cups. And the reason is because, I mean, yes, we have the fountain and everybody's got a cup, but these people look less like lovers and more like they're in a ritual, which is a place of trust. And then the Three of Cups is, aside from intuition, and friendship, it is a place of trust. It's about trusting your friends. The Four of Cups, this just looks like priestesses to me, and everybody has a cup, and they're handing this cup to this person. This throws that card upside down and gives it a whole new meaning, and I love it. I, I love it so much. I like my traditional decks, but I like my non-traditional decks too. This is the Five of Cups. Those cups are kind of floating away. So that's pretty similar to the Five of Cups. That's a pretty, I mean, self-explanatory card, I guess. Six of Cups. I love the Six of Cups, again with friendship. But because of the halos, and you see we've got beams coming down, that again would have that feeling of, for lack of a better term, soulmates. Because in my world, you have more than one soulmate and they serve different purposes in your life. They may be romantic, some of them are romantic. Some of them are could be, for fuck's sake, they could be your pet. They could be one of your children. It could be a parent. They could be somebody that you work with. It, it can be all sorts of relationships. Your child. It, it's just, there's no limit on who could be your soulmate. The Seven of Cups. It's interesting to me that you have this big cup and then all of these little cups. And this kind of takes that rider weight idea a little bit further to point you directly to the cup that has the spiritual meaning to it. These are all looking more like spiritual cups, but this one really is pointing you more towards spirit than towards all the other choices that you have. Eight of Cups, this one reminds me a little bit of the Toth deck. 
um, which is such a beautiful card in that deck, but kind of sad because all the cups are not getting filled. But all of these cups are getting some of this water, which is kind of telling you in this clear, beautiful, crystalline mountain picture that there is enough intuition and spirit for everybody to have some. I love that the tarot card reader is a nine of cups and that, but still that smug look, this is a person that's right. This is a person getting what they want. And I think that that's pretty, pretty fair as far as the nine of cups goes. The 10 of cups is really wonderful because you've got two roses indicative of could be two people. You've got what looks like a priestess with this very glowing cup and then all these other cups. And you know, the 10 of cups is usually that feeling of finding partnership, finding true partnership. And this, the true partnership is themselves. It's all inside themselves and probably a bunch of guides. Okay, is this the Princess of Cups? Princess of Cups, you can see that there's another person and this is, uh, I would say, part of the drawing down moon, the invocation. Prince of Cups, again, lush. Remember, this is autumn. So this would be Samhain. That is summer, so that would be, that would probably be Mabon or Litha, Lunasa. This is springtime, so this would be in bulk because pretty early spring. And this is winter, so that would be Yule. This person looks upset. This person really looks like Mars. We've got the lion, got the crown that goes with the aces, and it's kind of being handed to you. A lot of strength there. But swords can be intellect, they can be conflict, they can be all sorts of stuff. They can be arguments, they can be discussions. Two of swords is interesting that we're going off with one sword and we've got one sword in reserve. Let's think about that. A lot of times that's a choice. This person is going with one choice, but they have the other one in reserve. The three of swords we saw in one of my readings and this just feels like such a gateway. The three of swords is such a painful card so many times. It's like a heart being stabbed three times. So I kind of really love that this is a gateway. It's kind of, what do you call it these days? Shadow work? The four is everything is finally lining up and you're just kind of laying it down. This is the card where you're laying to rest, but you've still kind of got that one sword for protection. Five of swords, this is, yeah, everybody's fighting. We're pissed, we're having a discussion, we're fending people off. It's not, not the happiest of cards. Six of swords, it's really a weird choice for this deck, but Taking the stork and the babies, the stork is stabbing itself to feed those babies. And the phoenix, kind of an eagle and a phoenix coming out, it's saying that hard times, this would be hard times where you have to bleed to feed your babies. I'm sorry, I had to leave that wrong because it was funny. And then rising from the ashes. This is, the six of swords is, it can be leaving the choppy waters behind for smooth, smooth sailing or it can be a trip, a long distance trip, but this, I mean, kind of looks like going in a direction. The seven of swords, everything is stacked up and everyone's playing musically. Again, we've turned around and tossed this card on its head. And this to me looks like a ceasefire. This would be a ceasefire. I know they're swords, not guns, but you know what I mean? The fighting has stopped. People are playing music together. We don't know for sure if that fighting is going to resume again. Eight, we are doing battle. Everything is identical. And this card does look like it's moving. So we have yet another one that's symbolic, symbolically different. Nine of swords, interesting. That's anxiety in a lot of things. And this anxiety is very interesting. This makes it look like it's a fight with another person, but this could also be a fight with your psyche as in the traditional Nine of Swords. You know, there again, whatever you put it next to is gonna make a difference with most tarot card meetings. The 10 looks to me more like the 10 of Wands. So this is having this person want to fight, but it's a fight, you can tell. This is a fight they did not want to have, but they had this fight. And it could easily be betrayal like the 10 of Swords because of that, but there's all these swords on the ground. So this person's probably been attacked multiple times. It could be the calling of the quarters if you do it that way, but it's part of the invocation. 
And we have this beautiful party colored coat walking down the summer path. My video stopped itself because my camera was being a dick. And this is the last card that it got in full, so we're gonna have to go through a whole suit again. Not that bad. It could have been so much worse. The next card is the queen. Again, we are in the springtime. We got fire because it seems like the, whoops, had that one on the table. It seems like the swords are fire here instead of air. I still read them as air, so. I noticed I got a little bent right there. I wonder if I do that today. And the last card of the swords is the king in winter. Again, with just a little bit of fire there. And the white cloak. All right, last suit. The ace of pentacles. You can see now we've got a figure that's on the ground looking up at the pentacles. So this is a much more earthly card. We've got the bull of the earth. We've got the crown. Like I think we had those on all of the aces. The two, we have a very strong figure carrying a well-balanced weight and keeping, just holding on to the weight. Kind of says similar things to the juggler who keeps all the balls in the air, right? But we're getting paid here, so that's interesting that that's for services. It's a little bit different. The three is the artisan card. And once upon a time, back I think a little bit before the Renaissance and earlier, embroidery frequently done by men was considered a fine art on the same caliber as painting, sculpture, etc. But this is the card of the artisan. Again, reminiscent of the Empress. Got roses, it's abundant. The Four of Pentacles, we are protecting what's ours. Five of Pentacles, you got a bunch of rocks, which sucks, and you're by yourself in a cavern. Yikes. The six looks like a Beltane celebration to me. There might be a Mary begot later. That is some big time fertility, generosity, etc. I mean, there's a big fat feast. It's, I want to go. That looks like a good party. The seven, a lot of times this is resting during work, whatever, you know, from your work, from your artistry. But this is somebody who's generally pretty good at, I'd say, their job. If you're an artist, then your art is the job. I love that there's a little nod to Rodin's Thinker and uh, it almost looks like Disco Bolo there. There is um, a little bit difference on this card. Again, we have that muscle bound person and they're holding books. They're, this would be a person who's super knowledgeable in their career or art. This is very reminiscent of, I mean, this is pretty much straight off the card, abundant and a lot of lush. You see all the trees, they're all very phallic though, interestingly. This figure is pregnant. If there is a card of pregnancy, it is the Nine of Pentacles. Ten of Pentacles is a much more stable, settled home life. And usually you'll have a little bit older characters, but the, this looks like a family who's coming home to mom and dad's house, like a young family. It's a little bit different, but I would say it's more a very stable type of happiness. Ten of, Ten of Pentacles is a great card. Again, we're invoking, but this time we're invoking Earth. I've realized now that I understand that these are all seasons. Oh, y'all, I needed some serious help. We have the prince walking down the summer road, carrying on to his little pinnacle. We have the queen. Again with the tree, and I guess they probably put that, it's just earth over there holding a pentacle. Nothing big to it. And then we have the king in winter, as before, the white cape green, you know. Very considered fertile. In this deck, I like how the pentacles are fertile as well as have monetary wealth. I think that's a really nicely done representation of the pentacles. This deck is really much nicer than I remember. And I haven't used it in years. I have not read with this deck in probably 20 years. I've had it for a long ass time and haven't read with it that much. So this was like going through almost a brand new deck and you guys got to come along for the ride. Thank you so much for spending your time with Love and Skulls Tarot. I appreciate every second of it.